soldiers, sailors, and airmen. You are about to embark upon the Great Crusade. The free men of the world are marching together to victory. Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and four shows this week about Normandy. And given that I live in Normandy, it seems to be a long time since I've talked about Normandy, but it's Normandy again today. But before I talk about Normandy, I want to remind myself how cool it is what I do for a job uh, and particularly interviewing or speaking to people who had relatives involved in this. I'm thinking about how special it was when Peter Cox was here from New Zealand talking about his father at Sidi Rizag out in North Africa, Mark Johnson, his uncle who left the Caribbean to fly with the RAF. Um, and today we have Professor Stephen Rabe, whose father found himself with other lost paratroopers in a Norman village. And that's what we've come to talk about. Just before I bring him in, if you're new to the channel, don't forget to click the button to subscribe. All the information you need is in the description below, links to the social media pages of my guests, the books. Today's book, this one, I'm holding it up there, The Lost Paratroopers of Normandy, links to purchasing it are in the description below. But without further ado, I'm going to bring in Professor Rabe. So good afternoon, Stephen. How are you today? I'm doing very, very fine. Um, uh, I'm very appreciative that you're having me on the show, and I hope I've and I, I particularly appreciate the opportunity to explain my book and perhaps persuade some people to purchase my book. Well, indeed. And, you know, as I said there on the top of the show, you know, it's it's really cool when you have someone who has a personal connection with the story. And, you know, in this case, it's your father and you've got a long, distinguished career in history. And uh, well, we won't say how many years, but quite a few. But this is your first World War II book. But, you know, you'll get, talk about your father as we get into the presentation. But if your father was there in Normandy, why so long to do a book about World War II? You know, that's a, that's a great way to frame the question, because you could just simply say, Steve, you waited over 60 years to do this book. Well, why so? Well, essentially, I, I've known about this story since my father told me when I was perhaps 10 years of age that that he had been hidden by a friendly French family uh, up in the loft of a barn for three days and that he was ravenously hungry, and that um, the farm family fed him some cabbage and melting butter. And he always proclaimed that this was the best meal of his life. And he would often tell us this story when one of us, my brother, my sister, or myself, wasn't eating, eating properly. And he would remind them that he had once been starving and this friendly French family had, had, had saved him, um, both in terms of hiding him for three days in the loft of a barn. Uh, beyond that, of course, um, my father my father was very unusual in that he talked a lot about the war. Uh, normally, a lot of veterans didn't talk about the war until they were in their 50s and 60s. He talked a lot about the war with my four uncles, all of whom were veterans. Three of them were World War II veterans, but they weren't combat veterans. And he would let me listen in when my uncles would ask him questions with the proviso that I wasn't to speak about this with anyone else. So I was absorbing all of this. Now the question is, well, if I had this and I became an historian, it's basically academic life got in my way. Um, I wrote, my specialty is US foreign relations and I wrote 12 books on relations with Latin America. I taught abroad, uh, I've taught, in, taught or lectured in 20 countries and I was on this sort of pleasant academic carousel and until I retired and got off this pleasant academic carousel, I never really had the time to pursue what I always wanted to do. Now, I kind of always thought I would write about, you know, my father and the men at Grand, all of those who survived, essentially were on this epic journey from Normandy to Berlin. My father was in, jumped uh, into Grand, was in the Normandy campaign, was in the Battle of the Bulge, and then jumped over the Rhine River the Rhineland fighting, they liberated Eastern European slaves, and then my father rejoined the 82nd, because by that time they were in the 17th uh, airborne, and did occupation duty in Berlin. And then he actually, what, and he did, he participated in the Allied victory parade down uh, through the Brandenburg Gate, down Unter den Linden. And then he participated in the parade in January 1946 in New York City. This is one of the most epic journeys in human history from, you know, from Normandy to Berlin. This is, you know, this is, so I was told myself I'd do this whole sort of thing and sort of trace his activities and those of his friends like Homer Poss and Eddie Page, et cetera. But it came to, as I began to get into Gren, that there was so much here. And there was such an inspiring and compelling story. 
And I guess it had never, I'd never grasped that I owed my life, that my daughter owed her life, that my grandchildren owed their life to the people of Grant. So it just, it's, you know, it took me 60 years, but I finally got here. Indeed. And as we were talk about in the show, it's, it's the fact that you take the story right up to the present day. You talk about memorialization and remembrance and how the people of the USA, the people of France and historians have, have grappled with this story, learned different things from it as the years have passed. And now we're at this point with 80 years of historiography, it's perhaps the right time to write about it. But you're gonna, you've got your PowerPoint. You're going to guide me. Tell me when to move on slides, folks. We'll so we go to number two. Go, go to number along. two. Go and, to number um, two. And um, basically over to you, Stephen, to tell this story. All right, go to slide number two here, please. The next slide. If this is one of the points we've already raised, of course, is that I was trained as a historian of U.S. foreign relations, and I am not a military historian, and most of your guests are very distinguished military historians, and so I wouldn't claim to be that. However, I did serve in the U.S. Marine Corps from 1970 to 76, so I'm roughly familiar with military uh, terms and strategies, etc. And I would also assure your audience who will say, well, this guy's an academic. He must have been in working in the office, working in intelligence or something. You no, know, like most Marines, I was an 0311. I was a grunt um, and I was a squad leader. And no, I was not an officer. I was a non-commissioned non -commissioned person. I think I kind of picked up my father's. He had a certain disdain for officers. Um, and so I was a squad leader. I was in command of, of 12 other men. Uh, so I'm familiar with infantry tactics also. And I like the way you say, I am a, a US Marine. I learned many years ago, you're never Once a Marine, no, I was a Marine. former. You just and, are. And I often, I often explain to people, you will say, well, I was an academic life for 45 years. That must have shaped me. No, the Marine Corps shapes you. The Marine Corps never gets out of you. Uh, and it made me rather different uh, uh, academic historian having had, because there are not too many academic historians who are veterans of the US military. Right. Brilliant. So we move to the next to the next uh, slide. And here again, the point is that obviously this book is very personal to me. This is my uh, great grandson, Ethan Amo, who is named after Star Staff Sergeant Penny Amo Ray. And again, I mean, it's, um, it's not an exaggeration to say that we all owe our lives. And the 21 men who uh, hid in the, the Rago barn all owe our lives to the Rago family. And I would simply tell listeners, I've met the one surviving member of the Rigaud family, Mark Rigaud, and it's over, it is just an overwhelming experience to meet someone who saved your father's life and in the end saved your great grandson's life. Mm. Right. Absolutely. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm unassuming lady she is, Martha, but that, that's, we'll get to that later. Right. Jay, Martha, Mark just, just celebrated her 90th birthday. It's, it's really quite wonderful. Now the question is, is there something new or different about my book? There have been studies of GRED and what happened at GRED uh, during the days between 6 June D-Day and uh, 16 June, when, when by that time about, about 110 men had made it back to safety. Uh, Gary Fox in 1990 wrote a book that, um, a very nice book uh, in which he had been in contact with the veterans uh, but it was privately published and did not have much circulation. It's a very, very good book. Um, it, here in Normandy, Dominique Francois has written a book in French, which is very, very useful. Um, Marty Morgan, who's, who, like you, has led uh, tours in Normandy, has written several chapters, and he's, he's spent over 20 years studying Gren. And then Professor G.H. Bennett in England is also, in terms of his study of the 507th Regiment, has written some good books. So, so what is, you know, and as an historian, I don't take, I don't take disputes with any historian. I try to build on, on the work of other historians and try to expand on the work of other historians. And so what's unique about this book? One is obviously I had the personal knowledge because my father took me to reunions. And what happened here, of course, is I met the children of the veterans and played with the children. And I renewed my acquaintances some 50, 60 years later. By by being the uh, child of a veteran of Grand, I gained access to more materials than perhaps historians could get. I mean, I don't want to be, it sounds like kind of boasting, but having being both an historian and also having a father who was there gave you a unique opportunity and gave you unique access. The other thing to remember is that 
is that there was much more material out there about these men. Because if you were a member of the 82nd Airborne in the post-war period, you were a legend in the United States. You were simply a legend. And in every town, come D-Day, reporters would go and look for someone to interview. They'd always want to interview someone from the 82nd Airborne. So as it turns out, there were stories in local newspapers about all, many of the men who had been in Grand, and they spoke about it that most historians wonder, were unaware of. So I began to do that. Even if you use something simple like Find a Grave, which is a public website, and you identify using ancestry and then the tools of genealogy of, of where, where a person, when a person died, where they were buried, and then you go and find, find a grave, you'll find that people have clipped to the Find a Grave website all kinds of stories about these veterans of Grand. So there was lots and lots and lots of material there. Now, the second and third things to, to why my book is unique is that um, my teaching abroad, and I taught abroad in 20 countries, taught me you must see all incidents through a variety of perspectives. So in this case, we need the French perspective, not just the American paratroopers perspective. We need the French perspective and we need the German perspective. So uh, I follow the lead of one of my endorsers, Mary Louise Roberts, who wrote a very interesting book, Normandy Through French Eyes. Well, how did the invasion look through French eyes? And she used and tapped into, and then I used, is that there was a vast collection of oral histories of, of French citizens, including people who lived in the village of Grenne, uh, that were on deposit at the Memorial M Museum in, now you pronounce it for me, Caen? Caen, oh. oh, yes. Okay. This is, a, this is a, um, a research tool that people have not used very widely. In addition, in terms of the German perspective, I do not read German, but my wife does. She studied in Germany as, as a uh, undergraduate. And Mayor Small, the longtime mayor of Grin, had collected a significant number of German documents, including the transmissions, the daily logbook of regimental headquarters. And he didn't know what to do with them. So he gave them to my wife. She spent a hard year translating this. In addition, then we began to gain access to the German German historians and, and reading about them. And in addition, um, we um, uh, began to look at some of these German books and we began to identify some members of the SS who attacked the village of Grand. And subsequently, not in the book, I've been able to identify uh, who um, uh, supervised the execution of, of, of nine paratroopers in the nearby village of Mesnilanga. Now here we you see, uh, I would just point out, there you see my wife uh, with Mayor Small working on some of the, the documents. And I put up there Homer Poss, because one of the things I wanted to emphasize is that my book is about people, not about weapon systems, not about battles per se, although we do have a chapter on the attack of June 11th, June 12th. And Homer uh, here, it's a really interesting because I pick up the paratroopers long before they enlisted. Homer persuaded his, his mother to allow him to list the age of 17. He went through basic training, he went through jump school, he went all through all these things with my father. And most incredibly in the post-war period, um, as you can also see from the picture, virtually every woman in Europe swooned when they saw him. Um, uh, but when, when he returned, he became a prominent member of his town. And even though he lacked a high school education, he became the city manager of Highland, Illinois, and then mayor. And there below, you see a chair that was placed in dedication near City Hall with, with his children, Keith, there on the left, and his daughter, Sherry, on the right. And as it turns out, in terms of my research, what was particularly critical as I first contacted Sherry, who we believe we met as children at the age of 10 at one of the reunions, et cetera. And she's a kind of keeper of the flame of both Gren and of the 507th uh, Regiment. And she knew lots and lots of people and she put me in contact. And she was my greatest repository and my greatest supporter along with my wife in terms of doing this book. So uh, the, the final thing I just again want to emphasize is that uh, my book is about people. It's about the people of the village of Gren, and particularly the woman of the village of Gren, and it's about the paratroopers and their lives, and their lives both before um, uh, entering the military and after World War II are extremely interesting. Okay. Now, here, here is the issue, the synopsis of Gren. 
I'm assuming, and I think probably true, is that large numbers of people who are listening now know something about grit, but there might be a small number who don't. So in like five, seven minutes, I just want to go through what happened between June 6th and June 16th. Okay. The key thing first is that on June 6th, nine plane loads of C-47 dropped paratroopers of the 82nd Airborne near the village of Grant. They were hopelessly off target, about 20 miles off target. In addition, one plane load of 101st Airborne troopers was dropped near the village of Grant. A, a glider that was attached to the 101st plopped into the, uh, uh, plopped into the swamps of the Murray near the village of Grant. Uh, other people would wander into the village over time. The thing to note is that most of the paratroopers landed in water that that around the area around the village of Gren is is normally rather wet at this time of the year. Um, uh, and it had was even you had even more moisture because the Germans had backed up for a handful of people, about five people from the 82nd drowned. Uh, when they fell, not, the water was probably three to four feet, but they drowned because they fell into drainage ditches, which were five or six feet. Now, all of these people are, as a group, the most off target of any of any paratroopers on D-Day. They moved towards the village of Gren because it was situated about 50 meters up in this land that is probably either at sea level or below sea level. Um, the village of Gren had about 900 souls, essentially an agricultural community. It was an ancient village. It had a church that dated from the 1100s, a rather magnificent, magnificent Romanesque church. On June 6th and then June 7th, a variety of things simultaneously happened. Once the paratroopers got there, the commanding officer decided they would stay, that they were hopelessly off target and would wait for people from Omaha Beach to reach the village. At the same time, the people of the village were acting on their own. They went out into the marae, the swamps, the marshlands, and began to retrieve all the equipment of the headquarters company. The third thing that was happening uh, simultaneously was that a command was given to the, a German division, a German division of Waffen-SS, the 17th Waffen-SS, to move towards Karata. The other key thing about Gren is that it is about 10 kilometers south of Karata. And both the Germans and the US High Command, General Eisenhower, General Bradley, considered controlling Karata, which sits astride between Omaha and Utah beaches, as crucial. So all of these things are happening. In addition, the people of the village, and one final thing that's happening, the people of the village, both the men and the women, simultaneously and independent, simultaneously and independently, vow to support the paratroopers. The women organized a two, two, day, two, two times a day feeding campaign for the paratroopers. They cook round the clock and they sneak surreptitiously into, into other villages uh, in order to obtain food. One thing I should note to, to listeners if they don't know, Gren is unique and it, it is not formally occupied by the Germans. There are Germans everywhere around in the area, but it's not occupied by the Germans. In addition, the men unanimously vote to support the paratroopers. And men then begin to carry out intelligence and go on reconnaissance missions with the paratroopers. Over the next three days, say through June 9th to June 10th, things are relatively peaceful. People are wandering in into the village. Two men from Omaha Beach actually wander in from the 29th Infantry. An Australian who was part of the RAF who had to bail out wanders in. A whole collection of people wander into the village. Generally speaking, the patrols don't meet much. Occasionally, there's a little bit of contact with Germans. A couple of things happen on June 9th and then June 10th. On June 9th, the paratroopers blow up a bridge just north of the village, and there is contact with a German unit, probably an Eastern European unit made up of Ukrainians. Also on June 10th, the, the um, one group of paratroopers, mainly from the 101st, who were trained infantrymen, uh, encounter advanced elements of the 17th SS that are moving towards Karata. And they uh, kill them and they examine their documents and find that, that a major, major military unit is moving towards them. Now, the climactic day, the longest day for Gren, is the day of June 11th, June 12th. In the morning, a German force, not the SS, 
launches an attack on Gren and they are routed. Indeed, the uh, paratroopers call it a mass slaughter. Then in the afternoon, the 17th SS, which has had trouble making it this far because they have been, been buzzed by P-51s for several days, they, they uh, launch a kind of probing attack to find out what, what, is, what is there in the village of Gren. And they are pretty, pretty accurate about what they report back to headquarters and that it's, it's a company size force, which is true, somewhere between 160 and 180 men. Uh, that they have a couple more uh, uh, 81 millimeter mortars and they have some machine gun which is what they have. This was a headquarters company. In the evening, they launch a bigger attack with preparatory firing from howitzers that destroy the outpost or the lookout post where they were uh, guiding mortar rounds and then launch a, an assault upon, upon the village, an infantry assault. The paratroopers run out of um, ammunition and decide and the order is given to withdraw from the village. The when the German SS enter the village, they loot, they act in a rather bizarre fashion, they start drinking rather heavily, and then they begin to execute people they capture. People have been left behind in the church sacristy who are wounded, and then other paratroopers they capture, they move. While they're conducting these war crimes, uh, about 90 men successfully withdraw under the command of Captain Brummett. And another, over time, another 20 uh, hide in the Rigaud Barn, which is about three kilometers away from, from the village. And all of these people eventually escape with the help of the French. And by June 13th, 14th, 15th, the, um, um, uh, most of the paratroopers have made it to safety. Um, uh, the SS themselves will launch an attack on Karata on June 13th, their, their designated mission, but it will be unsuccessful by the end of the day, they are in complete retreat. Now, if we just go back here a couple, if we go, well, we can look at these two and go back a couple slides. Here you see the famous, well, here you see General Eisenhower talking to the 101st. Uh, General Gavin did not want Eisenhower to speak to his troops. He thought it would be a distraction. Here you see a paratrooper to the right, uh, uh, jumping. This was in my father's photo collection that my sister found when she did attic research for me. Um, I don't know if it's my father jumping, but you can see the paratroopers in excellent condition. He, his parachute has opened. He's perpendicular to the ground, which he should be, and he's turned 45 degrees from, from the uh, uh, airplane, which again is what, what you should do. You also see parapax there yeah. uh, beneath, yeah. beneath the plane. Uh, people should know that the, this was a headquarters company that carried machine guns and two 81 millimeter mortars, which is the heart of the military strength of the of the battalion. And so they, they could not jump with these things. So they, they went down in separate par parachutes. And of course, the people of Grin went out into the moray and retrieved all of these uh, parapets. If we go to the next slide. Here are just a few people, the mortar men of the platoon, that, that is my father in the sweater, the big guy to the left. All the people here were at Gren, and here you see the mortar men in a kind of bonding where they all shave their heads. The man to the, on the top row to the extreme left is Lieutenant Farnham. He was killed when a howitzer hit the bell tower of the, of the uh, church. He was directing mortar fire from there and directing it very, very precisely. And here, of course, is the ultimate paratrooper, General Gavin, out on patrol, which he was known for, simply to go out on patrol by himself. I mean, he is almost like a god to the uh, to the paratroopers because he's prepared to do anything uh, that, that, that they have to do. His famous injunction to officers were, a young man, in, in this outfit, you jump first and you eat last. And that's the way officers were to act. And then we go to the next one here. We have one more, I think, one more slide. Here, here again, we have the church, the 12th century Romanesque church. And here are a couple of canals, which actually are canals that go underneath the bridge that was blown up. But the whole area is, is of, to understand about Grand is that at or below sea level. And well, it's much improved 80 years later in terms of the canals, et cetera. Much of the area was flooded. And it was very, um, the paratroopers reacted very strongly to seeing some of their paratrooper, paratrooper buddies drown. Uh, any paratrooper will tell you the worst way a paratrooper can go is to drown. 
and about five of the paratroopers from the headquarters company of the 143 men who dropped from the headquarters company of the 82nd Division, 3rd Battalion, uh, 507th Regiment, uh, five of them drowned. And I just want to jump in for a second. Go ahead. And it's, it's interesting because one of the myths about D-Day generally is that lots and lots of paratroopers drowned. And when you look at the drop zones up near San Ruggles, actually not that many drowned because the water near Lafayette, near drop zone D, near, near Carenton wasn't that deep. But the distinction about Grenier is that the water there was distinctly deeper because I, I, when I take groups there, and you made this point yourself a minute ago, that the Grenier today in 20, 2023 is not the same as Grenier 80 years ago because it's become much more Correct. part of almost um, the, the environment of Carenton. It's been swept up by modernization. And in a way, people commute to, to San Lo, they commute to wherever. But back in the war, back and before the war, it was an isolated community of fishermen mostly, wasn't it, and traders. It wasn't farmers like you get 10 miles north, 10 miles south. It was this strange like Delta area, I always think it's a little bit like I imagine Louisiana to be, you know, Cajun right. country. It's it's people right. with flat bottom boats. It's little, instead of having a, 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 a car parked in front of a house, you have a boat tied up against a, a jetty in front of a house. And that's where you got your, 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 your living from is fishing and, 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 and collecting and stuff in the water there. So granular, the water is, I've, I've walked across some of these marais in the winter and it's not two foot deep, it's four foot, it's five foot deep. So I want to make the distinction that people who understand that Normandy was flooded, the area around granular is not quite the same as the area elsewhere. Right. Uh, there were two, two points I'd add to that. One, uh, Mark uh, Rigaud told me that as a child, she was 12 years old in 1944. She said, I thought we lived at the end of the earth. That it was yeah. so isolated. You know, they were three kilometers away from the village. The second thing is that the battalion surgeon, Captain Sofian, spent a couple of days tending to all of the paratroopers who who grabbed one of their knives, the one here at their shoulder, and were slashing at their risers and they would they cut their arms and their fingers, etc., because they were in such panic because they were struggling uh, um, to. Um, uh, survive what had happened. And I would tell you that my father developed uh, post-traumatic stress disorder in his 40s. And what he basically, he was just a regular swimmer. He used to swim with us, my brother and myself and my sister. He'd do dad things, swim under the water, swim between their legs. But at a certain point, he became afraid of water. What triggered this, I don't know. And he told my brother, every time I see a body of water, I see a paratrooper drowning. And my guess is that he probably saw one of his buddies struggling and he couldn't help him and you know, some guilt came, et cetera. But this was a real, on the day of June 6th, this was an overwhelming experience for many of the paratroopers. They didn't drown, but they, 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 really, they were underwater and they had to slash at their risers to get them out. So it's a very, very important yeah, and the fact that when we talk about isolated paratroopers, again, a bit of a myth has, has got up about everybody being lost because a great majority of paratroopers from the 101st, 82nd, up near the drop zones near the beach, they're maybe a mile or two away from where they're supposed to be. So, uh, you know, they're fit young paratroopers who run three miles before breakfast, you know, an hour down the road, you've made it to your intended rendezvous. But these people, as you said, it's not just 20 miles, it's 20 miles with limited uh, routes through the floods because you know the, the area up near San Miguel, which I keep referring to, there's you know five different ways between each village and the next village. Grania, there's this weird road network where, as you know, around it, you know, there's only one single way you go, go up towards Tribahu, you go the other way towards uh, uh, Mont Martin on Grania. So, you if you're if you find yourself there, you really are isolated, you are really a long way away. Well, I know you're going to talk about the lost barriers in a minute, but you're a long way away. From, from salvation and, and what the plan was all about. All right, so let's now go some of the key issues of yeah. having gone through the kind of brief, two brief synopsis. Let's ask some of the major questions. Okay. First of the question, why are they so far off target? Well, here's my answer to you. I do not know. And I would simply quote uh, Captain Dave Brummett, who will become the hero of the paratroopers and win a silver star for his leadership, who wrote in 1999, it's been 55 years, and I have thought and researched and investigated for 55 years, why are we so off target? And I still don't know. What are the possible reasons? Well, the, the trip across the uh, Atlantic was uh, very peaceful and very beautiful. 
And I have a section in my book because many people had asked me this question. I wonder what the paratroopers were thinking about when they were going across the Atlantic. So I have a little section on that. Now, when they hit the coast, they hit very dense cloud cover, which tended to scatter the C-47s. Then they, re they received intense flak. My father would say, always say it was the flak. And then other people would point out that the 507th Regiment was the sixth of the six regiments to arrive over Normandy. And so they point out that, uh, uh, that the Germans were ready. The Germans were ready. Uh, um, and so that may have contributed to intense flak. The paratroopers speak about there was intense flak when they first crossed into Normandy. And then in the last minute or two, there, there was very, very intense flak. Other people, Marty Morgan thinks maybe one of the lead planes missed a checkpoint, that's a possibility. And, there, and it could be several things across the net rather than just one. Other people have suggested maybe the lead pilot in the V of Vs of the nine planes uh, followed the wrong river. Again, no one seems to really quite know. I suppose people could have interviewed what the, the pilots and no one ever never bothered to do so. Um, what I can tell you is that when the paratroopers jumped and all of them say they don't know why all of a sudden they jumped, that, that they saw that people were, were jumping out of the lead plane and so then everybody just decided to follow. They jumped at an incredibly low altitude. Most of the paratroopers say 350 to 500 feet. And so I tell, ask any of your listeners after this show, go outside and look up in the air for about 125 yards and estimate 125 yards and just imagine yourself jumping at that height. My father told me that, that he um, normally when he jumped, he said the first thing he would do would be to straighten his helmet because he'd get the shock of the helmet knocking it over his eyes. He said he, he straightened his helmet and he banged, he hit hard. He actually did not land in the moray, but landed on hard ground. He said he landed really, really hard. Um, but in any case, all the paratroopers say that the jump, the jump altitude was very, very low. And it led also to some, some injuries. All right, so if we go to the next slide here. Well, I put this slide almost, it seems to me, kind of almost, it's very humorous. There is now a memorial to the 507th Regiment at Amfreville, which was where they were supposed to land, which is a few miles from St. St. Mary. Um, and, and they were to block, they were to be blocking forces and also to help capture the, the town. Um, so they put this memorial here where they were supposed to be. But of course, the humorous thing is the 507th was scattered everywhere. I think only one battalion landed near the, uh, near the memorial. Uh, standing next to the memorial is the historian Dominique Francois, who's very influential in arranging for this memorial. He's an historian of the 507th, and he and uh, Colonel Frank Naughton, then a lieutenant, uh, uh, worked to, to establish this memorial. All right. All right. So the next slide. This is, of course, the great debate. And this, in many ways, is the most important issue. Why did the paratroopers stay in Grenier? All right. Um, they all move to the higher point and get out of the water, get some warmth, go into people's homes, warm up by the fireplaces, et cetera. <clears throat> but the commanding officer turned to be the executive officer of the battalion, uh, Major Johnston, ruled that they would wait in the village and wait for people from Omaha, uh, Omaha Beach to reach them. Now, his reasoning was such. Um, he said that, as you explained, Paul, the difficulty of getting back to our intended landing zone would just be too hard. He also knew that the paratroopers had been traumatized by the drowning and a you know, large number of them did not drown, but they had the experience of thinking they were going to drown. The idea that they were gonna cross all this water, all these drainage ditches, et cetera. And as it turned out, several of the paratroopers did not swim. Uh, Major Johnston also reasoned that uh, they would have to spike they couldn't carry the 281 millimeter mortars and um, they would have to spike the mortars. And, when, and this was you know, crucial to being a support force. Uh, the other thing is that the decision was in many ways influenced by the decisions that the villagers had made already. They had already gone into the moraine. They were already bringing in the, the, the mortars, the mortar rounds and the machine guns. And very quickly, someone like Lieutenant Reed I uh, would say, boy, we had all our ammunition. We seem to have enough ammunition for several weeks. Um, so all these factors influenced Major Johnston to decide to stay in the village. 
Now, there was a debate between Major Johnston and the second person in command, Captain Brumman. And officers 30, 40 years later who survived were still amazed that this debate took place, that this, there was yelling and screaming between Captain Brumman and Major Johnston. Captain Brumman, who was always well prepared, had already mapped out a retreat plan. He had figured he was the first person to figure out where they were, and he had a big, big silk map, and he had already mapped out a retreat plan. He pointed out that this is a headquarters company. This is not an infantry company. They are to support the other three infantry companies in the 3rd Battalion of the 507th Regiment, that they are not prepared to be in a fixed position. Now, he, while he didn't raise the issue, the obvious is they would have no support. They would have no artillery support, no air support. Uh, they had no heavy weapons, no tanks. They had no mobility, no jeeps, etc. There were two jeeps in the glider that had plopped into the moray, but it had been ruined by the morning. He also wondered whether, since they were not trained as infantrymen, whether they would be able to, to sustain any type of assault. But his basic position was, we are a support company. And we're, we need to support the original mission. And again, if people don't understand in a headquarters company, this is what they had. They had a lot of communications. One man, Eddie Barnes, dropped with a switchboard, a 25-pound switchboard tethered to his leg. There are nine, there's a battalion surgeon and eight medics in this contingent. None of them are armed. I presumably they are not armed and never were armed. So that this, their numbers are, their strength is exaggerated. Nonetheless, Captain Brummett lost, lost the debate, and uh, he decided, you know, he, he then tr sought to implement what Major Johnston had, um, had ruled that they would stay. And I would point out by June 9th, it seemed that Major Johnston was quite correct because two men from the 29th Infantry, actually from Omaha Beach, actually wandered into the village, one of them carrying a, a, a BAR, a Browning automatic rifle. So it seemed like the men were getting closer. And I would also say, well, Captain Brummett in retrospect seems to be correct. I don't know, how, you know, on June 6th or 7th, if they tried to make their way back to Omfreyville, they were likely to run in to large contingents of German forces. Yeah. The situation is very different on June 12th, 13th, when they're retreating, as it is on June 6th, 7th. So, you know, there are good arguments make, to be made, but this is why they say that everything thereafter flows from the decision of Major Johnson. Uh, and just to jump in again, uh, Stephen, I think sometimes we forget as well in military situations that it isn't a question of between choosing between do, two good options. It's between two choosing between two shitty options and choosing the least shitty of the two so yes sure staying 20 miles behind enemy lines with a limited amount of support troops seems a bad idea some ways but so does moving a group of people through 20 miles of countryside so it's not about choosing the best it's about i think often selecting the least crappy correct I, and i would also add that i read a a um kind of memoir by uh uh, Lieutenant Naughton, ultimately Colonel Naughton, um, and he had a very interesting take. He he was very surprised at the tenor of the debate. He said that while he could understand Major Johnston's decision, he thought that after the second attack, there was a meeting in Madame Bossier's cafe of all officers, and they knew that the ammunition was running out, and he said, we should have retreated then between the second and third attacks, which makes a lot of sense. Um, but Major Johnson, I think, is very much influenced, and here is where villagers were making history. Major Johnson is very much influenced by the by the commitment of the villagers, from Mayor Voidy on down, uh, and he's you know, and there was a, a reluctance on, on his part by June 11th to actually abandon the villagers, and it's against the ethos of the 82nd to retreat, etc. But uh, uh, Lieutenant Naughton had a really good point that a good time to have retreated would have been between the second and third attacks until waiting to the disastrous third attack. Okay, we just go there. Now here, I, again, why, for people who have never been here, this is why people, why the paratroopers are landing in all these areas that are flooded, why they would have headed towards Grant. This is the remnants of the church memorial. But you can see the old village was about at, at an altitude of 50, 50 meters, I think, or so above 
what is either at sea altitude or below sea altitude. So this is why they retreated and why everyone uh, assembled here in the village. But they were also, of course, being aided by villagers who were telling them to go, go towards the village. Let's go to the next one. All right. Oh, here, here, these are two photos. This is Captain Dave Bremen. Um, uh, he won a silver star for his leadership, not only in terms of organizing the defense of Gren, but then leading the retreat of 88 people away and, and successfully leading the way. Uh, subsequently, he became a uh, career military officer and retired as a colonel. And he's one of the many men who had a little college and was very frustrated by the poverty you know, the effect of the Great Depression, not having enough money to complete his college. And so people like uh, Captain Brummett, uh, Lieutenant Reed, Lieutenant Naughton, um, uh, all became career military officers in order to achieve an education and then served uh, uh, for 20, 30 years in the US military. Now, to the right is Major Johnston. This, this is a collection of the, of the chief officers, of the 507th Regiment, and to the right is Major Johnston. Uh, he had been an ROTC officer and had uh, achieved his uh, college degree. But like everyone else, um, he is green in that none of the men at Gren had any military experience uh, or any combat experience. This is a brand, you know, this is a brand new uh, uh, battalion. All right, so if we go to the next slide. Now, this is the, you know, why I say this is about people, not about, uh, uh, is, is the issue of local heroes. And the big question that I think one, one must ask about the village of Gren is why did the people of the village of Gren risk everything for the paratroopers? And in the end, the paratroopers risked everything for them. Why were they motivated to become active participants in the resistance against the Germans? Now, when we're talking about the village of, of Gren, it's a village of 900 people. It's a mainly agricultural village. It's a village that focuses on the raising of the, of the famous Normandy cows uh, with their great output of uh, a very thick uh, a milk that can be turned into butter and other things. And they also focus on the production of calvados. Okay. Traditionally, when we think of the resistance in France, we think of people who are politically left, who might have been socialists, might have been communists, who might have been urban. But this is a rural area that had voted for the Conservative Party in 1936 in the last NAC. It's a village that it's an old village, at least a thousand years old. It's a village where people are 99%, uh, if not higher, Roman Catholic. It's a, it's a traditional village. It's a people with their strong intermarriage. Virtually everyone in the village of Goren is, um, is uh, related to everybody else. Right. Now, the former mayor of, the longtime mayor of, of Gren, uh, Mayor Dennis Small, points out that this is the only village in Normandy where there's 100% resistance to the Germans. Now, we can qualify that, that he did say that there were some people who were suspect, and so they were carefully watched. Uh, and probably some people left who might not have been attuned to what was going to go on. But why then, why then did these people resist? Why did the women of the village sneak into other villages past German checkpoints with food? Why did they show such courage? Why did other people go out on reconnaissance missions with, with the uh, paratroopers? Why did the entire village do everything it could to assist the paratroopers? There seem to me a lot of factors coming to this. One is that the growing German repression was taking hold here. When we're speaking of the village, many, most of the middle-aged men were veterans of World War I. Gustave Rigaud, the patriarch of the, uh, of the family, had German shrapnel in his knee. The parish priest, Father Le Blastier, had been a medic during World War I. It's a patriotic village. M many of the young men of the village were prisoners of war in Germany being held as hostage to the occupation of Germany. Then things are getting worse. The Germans are trying to force people into uh, labor where they'd be transported to Germany to work in war industry. So many of the young men are resisting this and they're in hiding. When they're in hiding, they lose their ration card. Life becomes very difficult. The rationing is becoming more difficult. The Germans are running out of local supplies. They are stealing food. They're stealing one of the two Rigaud cows. So the repression is getting worse and worse. 
Mayor Small also thought, and I think it makes a lot of sense, that it's very important that this is an unoccupied town. So you were free in this town to go to Madame Bossier's cafe every morning, have a cup of coffee and grouse all day for the rest of the day about how you hated the Bosch, how you hated the Germans. So there's all this kind of sense here of growing resentment and anger. Then, from their perception, divine intervention. They knew there is a local resistance leader who had told the mayor, who had told uh, Gustave Rigaud that the, the um, invasion is coming, but there's no formal resistance. But no one expected 165 paratroopers to be so all of a sudden floating down to their village. Now, I, I, I tell my listeners, I am not exaggerating. I have read a homily on the 20th anniversary given by the local parish priest, where he compared the paratroopers coming to the village of Grand to God sending his only son, Jesus, down to earth. That they perceive this in a way as some form of sign that they had to do something. Now, they are really angry. They are really frustrated. They are patriotic people. But all of that seems to have combined to let the people to, to give everything to the paratroopers. And one must remember their cost. Some, para, some villagers will be killed by the Germans. Ultimately, the torch, the town will be torched by Germans, not necessarily by the SS, but it will be torched by the Germans. The entire town for the latter part of June and the month of July will be forced into exile. The town will have to be totally redesigned because of the damage that occurred. So they are paying a terrible price, but why did they do so? Well, it seems to me all of these things combined. And I think that the fact that they were unoccupied gave them time to meet, to grouse, for their anger to grow about what had been happening to them. So if we go to the next slide, I'll identify some of the local heroes here. Now, the man to the left with all the medals is Albert Maguire. He is a formal member of the resistance. He was a hero of World War One, and he won the highest award from Charles de Gaulle at the end of the war for his leadership in the resistance. Now, most he is the only resistance person, formal resistance person, in terms of joining an organization. Next to him is Mayor Voidy, uh, who was not a veteran of World War I, but he was strongly attuned to the wishes of Major Johnson. Below Albert Maguire is the famous uh, Madame Bossier, the leader of the cafe, the owner of the cafe and the local uh, a grocery store, and a very and, and uh, you know I usually write the indomitable or the whatever about her. Uh, even when the Germans came in, the SS came in to the, the village, she was sassing them and saying, "You're looting our towns. We didn't do anything," and I'm yelling at them, etc. She is really some. She's really form formidable. The color photo there, of course, is of Mart and Odette Rigaud. Odette at the time was 19, Mart was 12, to the right is Mart, and uh, Odette considered herself a soldier of the resistance. Her boyfriend, Edouard, was in hiding because he was trying to escape the forced labor. Uh, to the right are the parents, uh, Gustave Rigaud, who's a veteran of World War I, and his wife, uh, also called Mart, and their little baby, Jean-Claude. I, I should note that he had been involved, the Rigauds had been involved in, in aiding the Allies as early as 1940, that the parish priest, Father Le Blastier, had asked them to aid fleeing British troops who were trying to get to Dunkirk. And so they actually hid some British troops for a day or two and then gave them peasant clothes to wear to see if they could make their way as peasants towards, towards the coast. And finally, this is the famous Rigaud barn where 21 uh, paratroopers hid from June, basically June 12th to June 14th for three nights uh, and which a whole variety of adventures took place at a certain point. Uh, the barn is very large and if you go up into the loft, you can actually almost stand up. There's about six foot of clearance. But at one point, two German soldiers entered into the barn, but they didn't look into the loft. Uh, uh, Eddie Page pulled a hand grenade to throw at them. Uh, and that would have been catastrophic because it would have led to the end of the Rigaud family, but uh, the soldiers didn't investigate. Then he was so nervous, he had to ask another person to put the pin back into the hand grenade. So all kinds of adventures. Okay. And just to jump in with a question again, Stephen, how important do you think the communication was? Because we have Benton Broussard, the uh, the Cajun who was with the 507, who was able to communicate because 
as I live here as an Englishman living in, in Normandy, you know, when historians come over, the first hurdle to overcome is communication. You know, a lot of the French here don't speak English. A lot of the, uh, the invaders didn't speak uh, French. So when you're trying to explain what you're doing and the purpose of D-Day and what the decision making is, the fact that the, 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 the villagers clearly understood what the intentions of these Americans were. They got to know a little bit about them because they would explain, I'm from Louisiana, I'm from this, this is the captain, the, my captain, Mr. Commander Johnston, blah, 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 blah. I think as, a, as, a, as an insider, in a sense, that I live in Normandy, that that communication issue was vital for establishing the bond. Um, what's your reaction to that? I, I would agree 100% because the first person to knock on the door of the Rigaud family, because a, a large numbers of, of, um, of the paratroopers landed around uh, where they lived, which is about three kilometers from Grand. The first person to knock on the Rigaud family door was Sergeant Brousseau, Broussard, who is a Cajun Louisiana. Mm -hmm. As I guess apparently turns out that the accent of Cajun French is somewhat similar to the Norman accent, but they were simply blown away that a person was speaking French. And I think he said something like, um, we are your friends, we are the Tommies, re referring to the British, we are here to help you. That helped a great deal um, and began to establish the bond. Now, th there are other ways that the bonds are established over time. Uh, the battalion surgeon, um, Abraham Sofian, makes house calls and he goes and tends to, to villagers who, who need medical assistance. But yes, absolutely certain that you had, you had Sergeant Broussard. I've also found in, in one of something I've never seen in any of the accounts of Grimm, that Sergeant Broussard at the end, after the second attack, actually was talking to villagers and thinking about putting on civilian clothes and seeing if he could slip through the enemy lines and get to a place where he could find some allied forces to come help them. Um, so there is communication, and of course, the communication between Major Johnston and Mayor Voidy is facilitated by Sergeant Broussard, uh, who speaks from the Norman point of view impeccable French. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, I should also, there's also one other, if we go back to the slide. Um, just before she died, Odette, there in the color photo to the left, sent a message to the Broussard family that she was well pleased with Sergeant Broussard. It appears a budding romance had broken out between Odette and Sergeant Broussard. So in all ways, the kind of bonding and communication. Um, I've been at dinner at Mark's house and we, we sang it's a long ways to Tipperary. Um, and they, she had been taught that song by, this, by the soldiers, uh, by the paratroopers. Uh, uh, the paratroopers gave her chewing gum and she didn't know what to do with it. And she swallowed the chewing gum. So I bought her a present of chewing, a Wrigley's chewing gum with a little little message saying, do, do not swallow. Sort of I always swallow. remember in my early days here when Odette was around at the ceremonies, when various historians, interviewers, and news teams were there, whenever Benton Broussard came up, she used to go red. She used to get a little bit kind of bashed. Well, it's, well, it's, it's, it it turns out and, it, coy and you know, and it was so clearly there was a little bit of an inf infatuation, perhaps is the, is the appropriate word there. But but that's the thing that that your book highlights is that you know for all the Personal. interest, and we're going to go into casualties and the repercussions and the, the war crimes of the minutiae of the details of the battle. At its heart is a human story. At the heart is 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 lost paratroopers and and French people who are willing to to put their lives on the line to help them. That is is essentially the story there. But I I don't want to steal your thunder and do your story for story for you. No, I guess that uh, at the age of ninety-three, Odette had a confession to make, and <laughs> she sent it to she sent it to uh, the the uh, Broussard family. Wonderful. All right, let's go to the next. One. Okay, the debate over casualties. First, very briefly, there's not much debate over the U.S. casualties. This is the memorial at Grand, listing the names of the uh, of the Allies who died, essentially uh, all Americans except for one Australian. The memorial has been redesigned, I think, three times as, as yep. casualties added. I think it's probably missing a couple. But here's what we would say about the U.S. casualties. I would think that the U.S., you know, prior to June 11th, the United States had had only one slight wound and had killed a lot of Germans. Paratroopers had killed a lot of Germans already. On 
June 11, June 12, probably about 30 men died from battlefield casualties. About five men were wounded, a couple badly wounded, who would be bayoneted by the Germans when they entered the sacristy where, where medical facilities had been set up and were pushed into a pond near um, uh, Madame Bossier's cafe. Unfortunately, I think a couple were still alive when they were pushed into the water. So that brings us to 35. About, you know, another 10 to 15 were executed by the SS. That some were, some, the uh, Captain Sofian, Captain Bogart were probably, probably uh, uh, killed by, there are conflicting reports and you get into the fog of war. We know most definitely that nine people were marched or brought to the village close by village. Uh, they were forced to dig their graves and they were um, uh, then shot in the back of the head and buried in, in uh, fairly shallow graves. So about 50 people uh, died. I can tell you on the last nine that it turns out that the person who supervised this was a squad leader named Fritz Voboda, who'd been involved in, in um, executions in Prague and in the town of Ledici. The reason we know this is he was captured by the United States. He was sent to Virginia and then he was wiretapped. And he bragged about this, about doing this. And he said it was justified and he gave some praised reasons. And there I have the uh, gravesite of Arnold Martinez, who probably was, uh, two people were killed, Lieutenant Farnham and another person were killed when an artillery shell hit the, the vantage point in the Bell Tower. I think that uh, Private Martinez was working with uh, Lieutenant Farnham and he had catastrophic injuries. He had, uh, when I looked at his uh, post-mortem on him, he, was, he, he had catastrophic injuries. Now, the question is, that's often risen and gotten a lot of heat and perhaps not too much light, is the issue of how many Germans did the paratroopers kill in the three battles? And someone like, you know, a lot, the number 500 has been settled on by some, okay? I know that you think that's too high, Paul, that yep. you probably yeah, think yeah. it's way too high. Let me kind of redefine it. If we look at all the numbers of Germans that the paratroopers killed from June 6th through June 12th, we can probably get to a fairly high figure, maybe not 500. One is I think that they killed quite a few Germans uh, when the bridge was blown up on June 9th. Okay. In addition, there had been scattered contact in which it had been paratroopers had won each one and had not suffered any casualties. Now, the key thing I think to remember is that the first attack was not carried out by the SS. It appears it was carried out by Eastern, an Eastern European battalion, mainly made of Ukrainians. Most of these Ukrainians probably had been dragooned into the German military. There are something like 45 Eastern battalions, and they don't fight very well during the Normandy campaign for the most part. It doesn't matter whether you read the memoirs of officers, of machine gunners, of the mortar people, of the infantrymen, they all say the same thing about the first attack. It was mass slaughter, that they couldn't believe what was happening, that they had pre-positioned, they had dug themselves in, they had pre-positioned their fire, uh, they had preordained targets, and that the attacking German forces just walked into these preordained tar targets. They walked right up the roads and they let loose with their mortars, they let loose with their machine guns, John Hinchliff, the famous machine gunner of, of the paratroopers of headquarters company says, he just, he just couldn't believe it. He was just firing away as fast as he could. He said, I was just mowing them down. So my guess is the casualty number of the Ukrainians is pretty high, is pretty high. And virtually all these people will end up with something like 500. Now, the second attack is simply a probing attack. And then the third attack involves uh, 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 the use of, of artillery and mortar attacks and then uh, assault. My guess is that the paratroopers might have killed 50 to 70 SS. There are accounts of them, even as the SS are running through the village of, of paratroopers shooting. So what the total number is, I don't know. 
But I think the key thing to try to understand this is that most of the German casualties occurred during the first attack, during the attack, in which virtually every American just says, I just couldn't believe what was happening. And these are men who went through the Normandy campaign, the Battle of the Bulge, to jump over the Rhine, the Rhineland fighting, et cetera. It was just something they they that they never had seen, uh, they, they couldn't believe and would never see again. So, uh, you know, you know, we'll never know. Never know. No, I mean, where did you come across the Ostrupen being involved in the Ukrainians? What, what, what was the, uh, the the Eureka moment finding about them? Oh, I, I'm not sure I followed your question. Could you say it again? Uh, when you de determining that there was Ostrupen, the Ukrainian troops there, what was the document or the piece of evidence you found supporting their their? their well, basically, it, it, you know, it's the. Mayor Small has some evidence, but I'm not, you know, I'm not sure. All I can tell, I'm not sure it was Ukraine. What I can tell you is that by the end of the day, there are some Ukrainian deserters in the village. Okay. That, that's one thing we, we could say. And it, a lot of people, I've seen a couple of things saying they thought maybe it was the same force as the one that was at the bridge on, on June 9th. But I am not sure. I am not sure. And no one has pr provided anything precisely. Um, uh, I think Mir Small has some documents that shows that this particular Ukrainian battalion was in the area, was in the area. But if they don't fight, what, what is clear from the transmissions is that the 17th SS deploys normal military tactics. And this didn't seem to be normal. The SS uses a, a, a kind of probing, the second attack is probing, see what do we have there? And they correctly assume, uh, correctly determined that it's a company size force and they even uh, identified the number of, of, um, of mortars and machine guns. Now, I want to emphasize that the SS does take some casualties. Gen um, um, Sergeant Major Slowski says a mortar team of the U.S. took out a mortar of the of the of the SS, and that is backed up by the fact that when my father. And two other, uh, Stephen Liberty, a mortar man, and another mortar man, uh, uh, finally reach safety. They are immediately promoted. Uh, my father went from PFC to corporal at the time. And I'm sure it was because they had taken out this German mortar. But again, I do not know. I do not know. And that remains, if there's any mystery for me about is, is the identity of this first attacking force. Okay. So we go to the next slide. So what do we got? Okay, the issue of Nazi war crimes, we've gone, gone over it already. Um, one other thing I should say about the casualties, when you look at the oral histories that were taken of civilians, of villagers of Grenier, one, one of the villagers says, a German said to her, you killed a thousand of us, and now we're going to take our revenge. Now, they didn't kill a thousand of them, but what I think is that in explaining part of the Nazi war crimes, the Germans had taken, the SS had taken a lot of casualties from the P-51s. My guess is that, that they had intended to get to a staging point to attack Carata by about June 10th, but they couldn't because the P-51s are constantly attacking them and they had to get off the main roads. They can only travel at night, et cetera. Now, when in terms of the of the Germans assaulting the village and taking taking control of the village, I think I'd make several points. Several of the villagers speak about their crazed look. And I'm betting on methamphetamines. I'm betting on that, that they had some drugs. Um, many of the, of, when you look at the profile of this new SS division, some of the, some of the people are 16 years of age. I would guess the median age is about 17 and a half. They're all teenagers, probably pretty easily controlled. Um, when they get into to the village, they break into wine cellars and they start drinking um, and are acting and start looting. And the people act that they, they say they're acting in a crazed fashion. One of the key things is that they don't do what I had taught in the Marines, that if you take the hill, you set up a perimeter and then you send out parties to find the people who are retreating. They never send out anybody after the retreating paratroopers, which which is why one of the reasons why they do escape. Now we, you know, the the issues are, you know, 
that when do they kill certain people? When do they kill, kill the battalion surgeon? Um, when do they kill uh, Captain Bogart? Um, I'm inclined that all this happens in the village. The reason being, there is one account that that says that uh, that they caught uh, Captain Bogart, uh, Captain Bogart, uh, Captain Sofian, and Lieutenant Maxwell on 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 the road outside the village, and there was a there was a firefight, and they killed them. The problem with that is Lieutenant Maxwell dies in the village, and his body was found in the village, so that's wrong. In addition, I don't believe that Captain Sofian abandoned the wounded people. In fact, his father, who wrote polite letters and was a very famous medical doctor in the United States, the army came to see the family and they say, they were told by the villagers that Captain Sofian came out with a white flag and that he expected, as happened many other times in Normandy, that medics would be respected and they would treat anyone, whether it be Amer Americans or Germans. Uh, so, um, they, but, you know, so, what we know here in terms is that the disproportionately the people who were killed were medics and then the wounded and members of the 101st Airport. And so I have very little doubt that uh, war crimes uh, were committed. I'm, I accept the judgment at Nuremberg that the Waffen-SS was a criminal organization. And I further accept the point of view of Stephen Remy, who's written a very important book on, on the massacre at Malmody, published by Harvard University Press, that they carried out tactics of terror war, and they were using tactics of terror war. Now, when you when you look at the histories written by some survivors of the SS, they they don't touch Grenier. I mean, it doesn't even exist. It's as if they had never been there, and I think they know because there were uh, war crimes committed there. Okay. Have we move move on? Yep. Now, one of the people killed, and there were four civilians killed, one being Father Le Blastier, who was allowing his sacristy to be used. And Father Le Blastier and his acolyte were tending to the wounded. He was killed. Uh, one of the people killed for the 101st Division was Richard Hoffman. Uh, Mark Bando, did you ever have Mark Bando on your show, the historian of the 101st Division? He, no, he, he hasn't ever been on the show, but I've known Mark for 25 years, yeah. Well, he, he writes a very moving account in an article about the 101st in Grenier, where his brother, Richard Hoffman's brother, went to see where his, his uh, yeah. brother was murdered. Um, disproportionately, members of the 101st were captured. The reason being is kept, these were infantrymen, and Captain Brummett assigned them to the flank because they were accomplished military men, trained, trained infantry men, where what he had was headquarters company who did not have this type of training. But that left them vulnerable to being captured. Well, he was one of the people who was murdered there. And then I, I point out to your listeners, look at this, this photo of captured SS prisoners, including some from the 17th SS. Look at their ages. These are teenagers. Uh, and so, you know, the 17th Waffen-SS was a new unit formed in 1943. It trained about 200 miles south of Grenier. Um, um, they were scraping the bottom of the barrel by this time, I think, and were taking you know, very, very young people. Uh, um, and given the way they acted, it was totally undisciplined. And of course, one of the, one of the ironic things is because they spend their time drinking, breaking into wine cellars, they weren't chasing the retreating Americans. Right. Go to the next one. Go to the next one. Yep. Now, this is another one that I think is Grenier strategically significant. I would say no and yes. Here's what I would say. I think... The, the key issue is, is the attack on Caratau. Caratau was controlled by the Germans, but the um, 101st attack on June 10th, June 11th, and gained control of the town on June 12th. Okay. It was considered so vital by General Bradley, he, he told US forces, if you have to obliterate the town, do so, but you must take control of it. All right. It had been controlled by the six parachute uh, infantry regiment of the Germans that withdrew. Okay. I believe that the basic goal, I think, would have been at least to be at the staging point by June 10th by the by the 17th Waffen SS for an attack on the They didn't make it mainly because of the P 51s. Hmm. Uh, just harass them constantly. And also, I've read there's a captured 
long interview with a staff member of the 17th Waffen SS who talks about the movement toward, towards Karatau. And he says that not only were they taking a lot of heavy casualties from the P-51s, but the men were demoralized because they kept asking, where is the Luftwaffe? You know, why are we being protected by the Luftwaffe? And they, of course, there is no Luftwaffe. So there's a lot of slowing down. Then I think that the attack on Grenier, uh, as demonstrated by the transmission, slowed them down another day. So they couldn't launch the attack until June 13th. You see constant uh, entreaties from headquarters saying, come on, get out of the village, get to the staging point. And it's the 1st Battalion of the 37th Regiment that will lead the attack on Karata. And this is the very same uh, battalion that attacked Grenier. But part of the problem is they're sleeping off their orgy of violence and of losing up in the village. So I think that both the P-51s and the paratroopers slowed the attack. That's crucial. Um, in addition, we look at, at strategic significance another way. The people of the village saved about 110 paratroopers. One way or another, they saved about 110 par 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 paratroopers, maybe even up to 120. These same, and remarkably, these paratroopers who survived the village survived everything. They made it to VE Day. Only a handful died. Many were wounded, but only a handful died. So it's strategically significant that the villagers saved men for the Normandy campaign, for the Battle of the Bulge, for the jump over the Rhine, for the Rhineland fighting, for the, for the liberation of Eastern European slave laborers, which this headquarters company did. Okay. Looking here at a couple of things, this is the uh, German General Austin Dorf of the Waffen 17th SS speaking to the commander of the German uh, paratroopers who had withdrawn. He told them the 101st is a really good outfit. And then here, here is, I think it's Holger Street in Karata, the main street uh, where the 101st had now captured. Um, again, I think it just gave, the Grenier and the P-51s gave the 101st enough time to reconsolidate its forces in the town and then to have the happy arrival of the second army division. I mean, my take on this, if you're interested, is that I hate these all encompassing questions where, or statements. When I, I've seen websites say the battle at Grenier absolutely prevented the 17th SS from getting to Carenton uh, by June 11th. And that, that to me is a false statement. What it does is it, it delays, you know, what, what a few, a couple of battalions are stopping off in Grenier. Yes. There's the, the strafing by P51s, P47s. Yes. There's the general hassle of getting there, but to say it simply delayed the division is, is simplifying it to a point where it's actually wrong. But yes, I'm absolutely with you that the action in Grenier and the, the involvement and the, the interdiction of the ninth air force things like is gen generally delaying the 17th air says getting towards Carenton. But I think there were units of the 17th SS that were, were making their way there and were not delayed by Grenier at all. And they were going to get there when they were going to get there. So I, my, my hatred is with these little simple statements that make things to be more than, it's like the same thing about Brecor Manor uh, behind Utah. You know, the knocking out the guns at Brecor Manor made the Utah Beach landing successful. No, the knocking out the guns at Brecor Manor were one of many things that made the landings and Utah Beach successful. And I think that's my caveat is it's one of several things combined that helps delay the 17th SS. And finally, and very quickly, I think we should leave some time for a question. We go to the last, last two slides and I'll just briefly, very briefly go over them. One, the issue of PTSD. One of my major surprise findings was that I found that every survivor Grenier, who was also at all the other action right on through to victory uh, in May of 1945, that everyone in later life had the issue of post-traumatic stress disorder. And I'll just simply speak here about John Hinchliff, the famous, the famous machine gunner. He was the last of the 507th Regiment of 2004 to live. He died at the age of 99, unfortunately, of COVID. It, at its age of 80s, he decided to build a cabin out in the woods of Wisconsin because he said he couldn't control his fear. He was worried that he would, he would do something bad. Uh, and this was all related to, his, related to his service. And so, you know, sometimes people use the term World War II as the good war. And I always discourage my students from using such a, such a thing and saying some wars are necessary and others are unnecessary. This was a necessary war, but there are no good wars because the price that these men paid in later life was quite high. And then finally, just simply, 
Uh, there I have, one, we'll just look at the last slide. Here is of course the famous Silk from the Sky wedding where members of the Rigaud family, uh, Marie-Jean and Odette are getting married in silk made out of parachute silk, uh, which the women of the village beyond collecting supplies and, and bringing in all the equipment also found the reserve parachutes and used them to make confirmation dresses, wedding dresses, for dresses. Below is Marthe Rigaud, the last survivor. Uh, she was 12 at the time. This is her birthday, her 90th birthday with her two daughters, uh, little Jean-Claude, who's no longer little, and her granddaughter. And again, I would tell people, it is absolutely amazing to go into this woman's house because on her mantle, not only does she have the Distinguished Service Medal from the Secretary of the Army, she has commendations to her father from President Eisenhower. She has letters to her on the mantle from President Reagan and President Obama. It is just absolutely amazing. And then finally to wind it up, there is another person she saved, my little granddaughter, and we're sitting at the World War II Memorial. My little granddaughter, Emma, and we're sitting at the World War II Memorial in Washington. And finally, you know, if I can't get to all the questions and answer all the questions, I'd remind everyone I'll take any legitimate question. And my email address is rabe, R-A-B-E, at UT Dallas, University of Texas at Dallas.edu. It's in the book, uh, but you can always uh, email me if you have any questions. I'll answer them. Thank you. And thank you for well, having me. Super stuff. We've got a couple of questions. Uh, Pat is asking, were any of those involved in the murders prosecuted for war crimes? Uh, the, the answer is no, and I'll give two reasons. The... 1st Battalion of the 37th Regiment attacked the village. By the end of the summer of, of 1944, I believe there were like 25 people left. Virtually all of them were killed. So there wasn't many people to kill. And the question of Fritz Swoboda, in which they wiretapped him, in which he bragged about overseeing the execution of people, not only in Czech, but also in, uh, at the village, um, they apparently felt they couldn't use that as evidence. So he was released in 1947, and um, he died in a nursing home at the age of 85. But the answer is no. no. Mm. no Unfortunately, that's part of the course. Whenever we do shows about um, uh, the Holocaust, I mean, uh, uh, Waitman Bjorn has been on several times talking about the Nazi war crimes. The, the fact is, is that way more Nazis who were involved in war crimes got away with it than were ever prosecuted by a huge, huge margin. So Unfortunately, that is that is one of those things that was that justice wasn't always um, where it should have been. But um, yeah, um, I think there's no more questions. Uh, well, one there: how accurate were the maps provided to the paratroopers? I'll answer that quickly: is that they were, except that the ones who were here didn't where they were wasn't on the map. So <laughs> and they, uh, when they went in, when the paratroopers went into the homes of the villagers and they showed them the map and they just shook their head and, and then pointed to, to their, their desk way below the map and said, this is where you are here, not, not on the map. Yes. Uh, uh, Captain Brummett did have a very extensive map. He quickly figured out where the thing was. Yeah. No, well, I think that's it for questions. So I think, well, we've done that. We've done 70, 78 minutes. That was, that's, that's fine. Um, I'll remind people again that the book can be bought from the links below or a, a bookshop of your choice there if we hold up our copies you were going to hold yours up as well weren't you Stephen? if we hold them up at the same time that looks good for the shot there so the lost paratroops of normandy a story of resistance courage and solidarity in a french village well i'm gonna leave and it at that very well, competitively people, tomorrow very middle, tomorrow evening we have uh, brian izzard coming on talking about the amazing admiral sir bertrand ramsey who was the mastermind of dunkirk but we're going to focus on the normandy aspect of his planning and neptune and then we've got a show on friday about the lacombe german cemetery but right now i'm going to say thank you everybody for watching thank you professor ray for uh, for participating and thank you everybody for um for your continued support of world war ii tv this is paul Woodard for the channel saying goodbye and see you all again tomorrow cheers everybody bye <laughs>